Isaiah chapter 1, beginning at verse 7. Isaiah 1, 7. Oh yeah, if you need a Bible, raise your hand up. And our men have Bibles for you way over here in this last section. Just keep your hand up until they get to you, and they will get to you. All right. Isaiah 1, verse 7. Your land is desolate, your cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation is overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom, we would be like Gomorrah. So, Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you would give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. So we started the book of Isaiah last week. Uh, Isaiah is prophesying in Judah from about 740 to 700 B.C., so about 725 years before Jesus. Uh, God had raised him up to speak the word of the Lord there in uh, Judah. And we found in verse 1 that uh, Uzziah, Jotham, Azariah, uh, uh, um, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, these men, these kings, were not fully following the Lord. Uh, some of them didn't at all, and others kind of did ho-hum. They had a ho-hum spirituality. So in verse 1, we found that kings were not following the Lord. And now in verses 2 through 9, we find that the people are not following the Lord. And Isaiah, he's an equal opportunity prophet. He speaks truth to the powerful, and we love that. But he also speaks truth to the powerless, because everybody needs to hear truth. It's not just the rulers. It's not just our government officials. It's just not the elites that need to hear the truth. It's folks like you and me, right? Uh, those of us who are maybe on the bottom stratum of culture or society or whatever it is. Jesus speaks truth. Isaiah here speaks truth to everybody, to the powerful and to the powerless. Now we're told here that uh, the land is desolate. In the second part of verse 7, it is a desolation as overcome by strangers. So due to desolation, Isaiah says here, the places you live are uninhabitable and the things that sustain you, they're unavailable. Uh, your cities, uh, you're crowded out of that. The crops uh, that you used to uh, sow and harvest, they're no longer available to you. And now the word desolation, a desolation is a disaster caused by judgment. So what was happening in the land, what made the land uninhabitable and what made their products and, and their provision unavailable was the hand of God upon them in judgment. Now, I don't know that if Isaiah hadn't risen up, they wouldn't have known this. Uh, the prophet Micah is also a uh, contemporary with, with Isaiah, and he has some really strong words to say to Judah also. But Isaiah points out here that what's unfolding in your land is specifically and intentionally the unfolding of the judgment of God against you. And here's why. If you turn back a few books to 2 Chronicles chapter 28. 2 Chronicles chapter 28. We know that uh, Isaiah tells us in verse 1 of chapter 1 that he ministered in Judah during the days of of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Now, during the days of Uzziah and Jotham, uh, no foreign armies came into the land. Judah didn't experience any kind of military uh, humiliation. They didn't have to pay uh, tribute to anybody. But Ahaz was a wicked king. Chapter 28, verse 1 of Second Chronicles. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do right in the sight of the Lord, as David his father had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He also made molten images for the Baals, an idol. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of ben Hinnom and burned his sons in fire. He offered his son up as a burnt offering. Now, it says sons there, plural. 
It's interesting that the commentators said this is probably just one son, but we'll go with the plural because that's what the Bible says. Uh, not, obviously not all of his sons because uh, Hezekiah was a, a son of uh, Ahaz, but he, he, he performed human sacrifice with his sons. Now, I don't, even, I don't think that just ticks God off. I, I think that would probably tick off the most hardened atheist in our land today. That'd be enough to make him lose his joy or her, uh, for her to lose her joy. It's like the Lord said, this is something I never thought of. I never thought someone would do that. But Isaiah, he burned his sons in the fire according to the abomination of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. Verse 4, he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places on the hills and under every green tree. This is the historical context for the prophecy of Isaiah. You can take all of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, you can take all of them and slot them back into the historical books of the Old Testament from uh, 2 Samuel on. Uh, they speak to their times. And so God raised up Isaiah. And I believe the only thing that makes sense to me here historically, contextually, is that he's speaking to Israel during the time of Ahaz. Because verse 5, Wherefore, the Lord God, the Lord his God delivered him into the king of Aram, that is Syria, and they defeated him and carried him away with a great number of captives and brought them to Damascus. And so he was defeated by uh, the Syrians. And then down in verse somewhere, it, it says that the Edomites and uh, oh, verse uh, 17 Again, the Edomites had come and attacked Judah and carried away captives. And the Philistines, they invaded the cities. And then Ahaz had hired the Assyrians to come and defend him from the, the Philistines and from the Edomites and from the Israelites. But he hired the king of Assyria, but the king of Assyria took his money and then came and afflicted him. I mean, so Ahaz just couldn't catch a break. And all because... He stopped following after the Lord. A desolation is a disaster caused by judgment. And Isaiah wanted the people to know what's unfolding in your land is the judgment of God due to the unfaithfulness of Ahaz and no doubt cooperated with by many of the people in the land. Now, it's interesting that Ahaz, what made Ahaz defect from the Lord and bring all of this judgment upon the land as he lays out in verses 7, 8, and 9. Ahaz's grandfather, Uzziah, we're told that he was marvelously helped by the Lord until he became strong. And then he grew proud in his heart against God. And he entered the temple to burn incense. And only a certain kind of person could do that. Who was that? The priests. So the king wanted to be a priest. And God said, no. And in leprosy broke out upon, um, upon the body uh, of Uzziah. And he hurried to get out of the temple and he was a leper till the rest of his life. And he died. And then his son, um, Jotham, became king. And we're told that Jotham did not enter the temple of the Lord. He was a godly man, but he didn't enter the temple of the Lord. He, he, he avoided it. Ahaz's father Jotham never entered the temple, and then Ahaz himself, he defiled the temple. So here's the progression. Uzziah, he abused it by trying to burn incense there. Jotham avoided it, and Ahaz, he abandoned it. To me, it's a, it's a pretty clear kind of progression. Parents, how important it is for you to model before your kids a life in Christ. How important it is that you live out the life of Jesus in your house. Because what you avoid, the Bible kind of gives us a pattern here, your kids will abandon. How important it is not just to shine on the house of God. To make sure that you're doing what God would have you do. The Bible says don't neglect the gathering of ourselves together. But there are so many Christians, and this is developed during COVID, that would say, you know what? A husband might turn to his wife, do you, do you miss going to church as much as we did? And she will guiltily look back and go, 
No, I don't. And, and so, you know, they kind of feed off one another. And, and church becomes a seldom, seldom thing. Well, Tim, you're just propping up, you know, you, you just want to get the numbers into your building. Any building. Don't go to this. Go to some church. God would have you in the house of God. God would have you sitting under pastors and elders. God would have you praying with one another. God would have you witnessing new life. God would have you worshiping him with, with the saints. And, and can't, can't you worship in the privacy of your own living room? Yes. And you can watch the A's in the privacy of your own living room. But there's nothing like being at the Colosseum. And there's nothing. When everybody, anybody asks me to go to an A's game, I go, oh, I don't want to go. But when I do, when I step into the stadium, the inner, it just picks me up. And I'm just so glad I'm there. There's just, I, what happens in the Coliseum cannot happen at home, even with instant replay. There's just something there about being, being with the fans. We're fans. We're, you know, hopefully we're followers of Jesus, but hopefully we're fans too. Yay, Jesus, we love you. Go, go, go. And there's something to being with the fans of Jesus that's powerful. See, at, at home, if, 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 if a guy hits a home run, I can go, oh, that's, that's good. We're ahead now. But in the stadium, it's Ah, you become part of the wave. Have you ever been part of the wave? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to. You know, <laughs> I'm waving. <laughs> and the Lord would have us get caught up uh, with one another. So um, Ahaz's father never took him to the temple, but that need for spiritual reality, it had to be met. And so Ahaz began turning to the spirituality of, of the other nations, which was idolatry. But Ahaz was not attracted to the things of God. He was attracted to all things foreign. And see, in his uh, little corner of the world, actually in every corner of the world at that time, a strict monotheism, it, it was out of step. It was politically incorrect. Because uh, in Judah and in Israel, the law of Moses, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God, and you shall love him and worship him and have no other gods before him. But here is Ahaz, uh, who was brought up to be a monotheist, there's one God, and he becomes a polytheist with so many gods, because monotheism was culturally out of step, it was politically incorrect, and he wanted to fit in with the nations. He didn't want to be scorned, he didn't want to be ridiculed, he didn't want to be laughed out, and he, wa he wanted to be spoken well of. And so he abandoned his theology, he abandoned the temple of the Lord, so that he might fit in with the praises of the people around him. And the result was this, is that Israel, the Edomites, the Philistines, and the Assyrians, they all invaded Judah, and they imposed tribute uh, upon uh, Ahaz, and they did damage to him. But that's Judah. Okay. How does that apply to us today? Uh, despite what you might read in some places, America is not a covenant nation. God did not make a covenant with America as he did with Israel. America is not a covenant nation. But there's some principles that apply to every nation. I don't believe that, and if you disagree, that we can talk about it over coffee after service. I don't believe that America was ever a Christian nation in that the majority of the people were born again or attended church. America wasn't a Christ-centered nation. It was a Bible-centered nation. Not Christ-centered, but Bible-centered. And our founding documents uh, prove this out. America was a Judeo-Christian nation where a common moral vision bound us together. There was widespread agreement on what was right and wrong as set forth in the Bible. Even non-Christians had the same moral code as Christians. Now, they might have violated, but they knew they were violating it. They knew they were doing wrong. Today, I don't think I'm doing wrong. But there was, there was a common Judeo-Christian ethic that, that bound together the moral vision of, of the nation, but not so anymore. And even as Ahaz abandoned the temple, many have abandoned the Bible for their own personal preference today. 
And so what is the disaster that we see around us? Well, we're told by Isaiah that the land is desolate. Desolation has been visited upon you, and so America. The Judeo-Christian ethic, biblical truth is abandoned, and abortion, pornography, alternate sexuality, raw displays of power, hatred, discrimination, and tyranny, they're devastating the land. Don't think that pornography is just a personal preference and that it, has, it doesn't do anything to your soul. Don't think that it doesn't do anything to your marriage. Don't think that it doesn't do anything to your heart. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Pornography um, um, Well, isn't it interesting that with the rise of pornography, we have the rise of the little blue pill? Uh, because men are not aroused as they used to be. Because, because there's, a, there's a huge percentage of men, even Christian men, who access porn. And because they, they are aroused by the pictures that they see, they're no longer available to their wives. And I've read where 50% of women, I'm sure it's lower percentage in the church, but 50% of women access porn. And they're no longer available to their husbands. There, 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 there is a desolation ravaging our land. I read where 50% of parents would support the, the gender reassignment of their parents. There's an incredible confusion that's come upon our nation concerning uh, sexuality and gender. I think it's very interesting that, I think I've mentioned this before, I don't know, but um, if, if you follow the science, you'll, you'll, you'll believe in climate change. If you follow the science, you'll believe in all of this kind of stuff, which, which may, I'm not here to comment on that, but it's this. But when it comes to the, what's more scientific than DNA, than genitalia, than gonads, than chromosomes? And yet you can deny that science and so if, if, if you deny the science of climate change, you're a complete and utter idiot. If you deny the science of DNA and chromosomes and all that, you're enlightened. It, it, it makes no sense whatsoever. There's a spirit of confusion. There, there's no logic. It's just a matter of personal preference now. And uh, again, all of these things have come upon uh, our nation Hatred and discrimination, they've just blown up these last two years. Some of you have people that won't talk to you anymore. Some of you, have, have, some of you uh, will not let other people in your life unless they're vaccinated. And some of you have people that won't let you in their lives until you get vaccinated. The whole split over Trump and Biden, that got nasty. I think Christians were nastier than the world. God forgive us there's just this the spirit of hatred and discrimination and if you don't think the way i think obviously you're an idiot and so i need to convert you not to christ but to my way of thinking and boy that has just spawned division and hatred and discrimination and there's a toxic toxic spirit that's discriminating that's that's um devastating our land today there was a darkness that was creeping over the land and the light was being pushed back yet god preserves a remnant that's what we're told there in verse 9 um, unless the lord of hosts had left us a few survivors uh, another some of your bibles might translate that remnant uh, it comes from a verb which means one who flees come out and be separate says the lord and touch nothing unclean. God will have a people. And the glorious thing is this, is that God has a torch that can't be extinguished. And that's you. The church of Jesus Christ. We're, we're a city set on a hill. We're a light that shouldn't be put under a bushel. God wants to shine through you. Uh, Mark was talking about this, this long work in Chris's life. Gave him a Bible back in 1995 and no doubt prayed for him these uh, 25, 26, you know, years witnessing to him, praying for him. The light of Christ came through Mark and finally it dawned upon Chris. You 
are the light of Christ. You are not to be extinguished. You are not to get sucked up into uh, the, the political correctness of our times. You're to follow Jesus Christ with all of your heart and all of your mind. So Isaiah addresses the political situation in verse 1. He addresses the national situation in verses 2 through 9. And now he addresses the religious situation in verses 10 through 15. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and of the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals, and your appointed feasts. They've become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. And here's why. Your hands are covered with blood. Now, no doubt when they heard Isaiah prophesy this and, and, and teach this and shout it out in the square, they probably pointed to the temple ministry. They would say, look, let's go to our temple there. Look, man, look at that beautiful temple. It's one of the seven wonders of the world. There we have the labor on the back of those 12 oxen and the priest ministering and the smoke of the burnt offering is going up continually all the time. Look at that. Are you telling me God's not pleased with that? Are you telling me that God does not listen to that? All of this stuff was built in accordance with the Lord. Certainly, God is in that place. But in verses 10 through 15, they didn't know it was verses 10 through 15, but they said, you just ripped it all to shreds. Are you kidding me? God is pleased with that. But uh, Isaiah would say, no, God views you the same way that he viewed Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's about to destroy you. God gave Isaiah eyes to see beneath the surface. All they saw was the surface. The gold and the beauty and the smoke. But God let Isaiah see into the hearts of the people. The people thought that religious ritual by God appointed priest would keep God on their side. Rebellion, they were rebellious and rebellion hates righteousness. But it loves religious ritual. And it delights in that. It rests in that. It salves its conscience due to religious ritual. Ritual preserves the form of religion, but it's devoid of the presence of God. Um, someone might say, well, I, I prayed 20 minutes this morning. Well, okay. Uh, but did you touch God? I'd rather pray for one minute and touch God than pray for 30 minutes and not touch God. Have you ever prayed for 30 minutes? But, I mean, honestly, your thoughts were, I can't wait for the next episode of Survivor, or uh, i got to get that carpet cleaned down at the church, or uh, this and that. You know, all, all these thoughts intrude. And so, you know, it's not so much prayer punctuated by busyness. It's busyness punctuated by your attempts uh, at, at praying. And you walk away from that, and you know that you really haven't come before the Lord. You know that you haven't poured out your, God, your heart before the Lord. But you might think, well, I was on my knees for 30 minutes. Certainly that means something to God. And Isaiah would say, no, <laughs> doesn't mean anything to God. That you're on your knees, or uh, uh, your hands are raised, or whatever your posture might be. Because God obviously is looking at the heart. God hates religious rituals that are devoid of righteousness. God hates our singing if we're not worshiping. C can you sing without worshiping? Of course you can. Of course you can. Uh, Alec Mott, you're one of the commentators, says this, uh, these religious rituals, they mean nothing, they add nothing, and they do nothing for the Lord. But many think that God is bound to bless them because of religious ritual. You know, if I, if I say something, then I go like this. 
That, that binds God. God looks at that and goes, what are you doing? <laughs> that doesn't bind God to anything. Ritual performance means nothing to the Lord. Uh, they came to the temple, but they did not love the presence of God. They gave without giving their hearts. There was motion without emotion. There, there, was, there was movement without progress. There was ritual without relationship. There was praying without believing. There was singing, but there wasn't worshiping. And God says, I'm not into that. You don't touch me when you just give yourself to that stuff. God's not into the form. God's into the essence of, of the thing. And so when we come to the conclusion in verses 10 through 15, it's that sacrifice, offerings, feasting, fasting, prayer fails. Why? Because your hands are covered with blood. Because those things that you gave yourself to during hatred, uh, p- pornography, uh, uh, addictions, a, a self-centered life, ignoring your wife, ignoring your husband, ignoring your children, just living for yourself. These things stain your hands. A self-centered, a self-directed life. They stain your hands. And we bring stained hands and raise them before the Lord. God says, I, I, I want to cleanse your hands. I want to cleanse your hands. And I can only do that by cleansing your heart. But they wouldn't raise their hearts to the Lord. They'd give their animals to the Lord. They'd give their shekels to the Lord. You know, uh, they'd give their incense to the Lord. They'd bring their peace offering, their guilt offering, their sin offering, their trespass offering. But none of it was them giving their hearts. I've heard people tell me before that uh, God, God knows my heart. And that is so true. And that should scare the hell out of you. That God knows your heart. He knows how hypocritical, he knows how selfish, he knows how self-centered you are. Martin Luther said, I have to repent of my repenting because my repentance is for myself. I just want to get right with God. My motive is selfish. I just want to get right with God. When you've got to repent of your repenting, uh, tell me, you're taking a real deep view of yourself. God no, does know your heart. This is what he's saying through Isaiah. I know your heart, and it's far from me. Some of you need to give your hearts to God this morning. Jesus Christ lived and he died and he rose for you. Jesus came. He died on that cross to wash the blood off of your hands. You know, I I asked each of these if they wanted to say something, and most of them did. Uh, You know, if they if they had told you their sin, who who was the first one baptized? Um, We'd still be here with TJ. You know, tell us all about his sin and sin and sin and sin and sin. But it's been washed away. And with Christie, it's been washed away. And with Deepak, it's washed away. Clean hands. I can lift clean hands before the Lord because I have a clean heart. Do you have a clean heart this morning? Doesn't mean you're sinless, but you've come to Christ that he can wash you and that he can purify you. He can take the stain out of your soul. He can take the weight off of your off of your heart and he died and he rose again to make you clean and to make you whole won't you come to christ this morning and the joy the the forgiveness the cleansing that we experienced here this morning with the baptism that can be yours if you want to know jesus as your lord and savior you've never confessed him as lord before in just a minute i'm going to ask you to stand up right where you're seated and at the home watching on the um, uh, live stream, if this applies to you, just stand up there in your living room. Paul the Apostle said that if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. And maybe you've never made that good confession before. You've never articulated that faith. I do believe, Jesus, that God raised you <clears throat> from the dead. And I confess that you are Lord. If you want to do that this morning, you've never done that before. I just invite you to stand up right where you're seated. And by doing that, you're saying, I want to become a follower of Jesus. I want to be cleansed from the inside out. I just don't want to play at life anymore. I want my life to have purpose. I want my life to have meaning. I want my life to be grounded in Christ. If that applies to you, if that uh, relates to you, I just invite you to stand up right where you're at. Love to pray with you.
I'd love to lead you to Jesus this morning. He's inviting you. Well, maybe someone there at home, you need to do this, so let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I do believe, Jesus, that you were raised from the dead. I confess that you are Lord. I confess and acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I need the forgiveness of Christ. Jesus, come and forgive me. Come and cleanse me. Come and fill me with the Holy Spirit. I give my life to you because you gave your life to me. Strengthen me to live my life for you. I love you, Jesus, and in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. And if you pray that prayer at home, there's a a number on your screen. Give us a call. We'd love to be in contact with you.